The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Well, here we are again, this time with Jay Stanford again. Uh, Jay, I appreciate you coming back a second time. And I felt it was really necessary because last time you went back through, well, I did as well, the history between the food bank and the city. And, and especially as, as it circled around that uh, curb hunger food drive, which used to be the blue box food drive and uh, all the different changes that happened there. Um, and now we have another one coming up. And I thought before we get into the uh, this concept of climate change, what the city is doing, I thought maybe we could just recap a bit. Uh, so next week is the food drive um, that we're going to have. And uh, I just wonder if you could take us through that a bit. You're so used to this now. It's been 20 some odd years for you. But what does that look like this coming food drive? Well, Glenn, it's, it's the 26th annual London Cares Curb Hunger Food Drive. And yeah. it's just amazing that we've been around this long. It shows that there's still a, a tremendous need in the community. But equally important, though, is that uh, to, to, to address that need is that it, this is a partnership that comes forward every year. Yeah. We've got some organizations like Tri Recycling, Miller Waste Systems, Budweiser Gardens that have been with us for years. Uh, uh, the, the market, all these folks doing their part, Joe Cools, helping us to help the food bank. But more importantly, is basically we're, we're helping Londoners. So on June 8th, we'll be launching the uh, 26th annual. And I think, Glenn, what, what, what some people realize is that it, it's the last food drive heading into the summer months. Yeah. And very important to help you and your colleagues at the food bank to stock those shelves over the summer months when donations tend to uh, they're a little bit lower. And yeah. we know that. But the key part, and this is what we talked about last week, is the evolution of the food drive. And this is the only one that's heading into the summer months, which is the growing season. So it became a natural fit as this program yeah. evolved to get into that growing momentum and more nutritious foods. What can be more nutritious than something that comes out of your garden, my garden, comes out of the community garden, or the gardens right at the London Food Bank? And that is what this food drive is really morphed into. And I think that is just wonderful because this is where we remain different than all the other food drives because we're the only one happening in the summer months. Yeah, no, that's right. And, you know, if people can help out, we certainly appreciate it. And each year as these things go along, it becomes easier to pe for people to, to donate online and direct that towards fresh food or whatever it is that we need to do. So we have options now that we didn't used to have 20 years ago, right? Which makes it easier for people to give. Well, it, it, it does. And, you know, when, when we talk about fresh food, one of the highlights of this program has been the evolution of the community refresh program. Yeah. And I just like to talk about that again, because it is a nice segue into what we're talking about today. So think about it. So grocery stores for years, unfortunately, when, when products were either hitting their expiry date or their best before date, or just the shelves needed fresh food, items were pushed out the back door. And that back door meant going off to the landfill here in London. Yeah. So you folks in, I guess it was 2017, worked with Food Banks Canada on a program to rescue that food. And it's such a wonderful term because think about it, it's through no fault of its own, it's going out the back door to landfill. So yeah. what happened? Over 20 grocery stores in London, I guess representing about six or seven chains, just wonderful, got together and said, we're going to rescue that food. We're going to make sure that it is diverted back to the food bank and so in 2017 i guess you got started with a handful of grocery stores now we're well over 20 but but i love the numbers glenn and let, let me just i'm going to look at my notes here i don't like to do that but when you start looking at the amount that has been recovered 807,000 kilograms so in pounds that's about 1.8 million pounds but when you think of the value that was heading out of the back door to landfill and there's a cost with transporting there. There's a cost with tossing it into a landfill site. Not to forget the other thing. That item, those, that amount of food is worth well over 
$4.7 million. So when you save that, that's going back into the community. And that's where the food bank comes in. Yeah. But I'm wearing a green shirt today, Glenn. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the environment and connect that segue before I hear back from you, though, is that environmentally, that food has all consumed energy in its creation. Yeah. It's gone through water in its creation, growing the food. Of course, there's transporting it from the farmer's fields and other parts of the world to get it to London. So that's all consuming energy. So now we're not wasting that energy. And in fact, the energy, when I look at my notes, that energy creates in the order of one point, well, 1,900 tons of greenhouse gases. Hmm. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's put it into a simple term. We have now avoided the creation of 1,900 tons of greenhouse gas or the same amount of greenhouse gas generated by 120 cars that are no longer driving in London now. Mm. So that, you know, becomes quite impactful. The other way of looking at that from a water consumption perspective, that's over 900 Olympic swimming pools of water that is now not wasted. Yeah. That's the key part, not wasted. It is now being consumed by people who can use that nutritious food right here in London. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, you've been a pretty innovative fellow. So has your department and your staff, and we've learned that over time. But I, it's interesting when you look at your title now at the city, Jay, it, you almost run out of ink writing it down. But it's climate change, the environment, and solid waste management. And it's interesting that climate change comes first in all of that. What, what are the changes that you have seen in your 27 years there that have really brought climate change more to the fore? Uh, presume that's not just for London, but for municipalities across the country. What's changed there? Well, I, you know, you step back in time, people thought recycling was the answer, yeah. right? And then there were the keeners who did a lot more. They, they helped to protect the natural environment. Yeah. But I think over the last 20 years, people have realized, you know, we used to talk about global warming. And that's a term, it's still used, but it's about our change in climate. And our change in climate is now attributed to our consumption of fossil fuels. Yeah. And this is not just happening in parts of the world. It's happening around the world. And we are seeing devastation in some parts of the world. And these are disasters that are occurring that are being attributed to climate change. Now, for some people here in London, they might not quite get the connection. But you know what? There's actually a very strong connection with severe weather, climate change, and what's happening here in London. We are seeing increases in temperature. If you just look what's occurring just this week, we don't normally get 30 degree days in May. That's also causing more drought-like conditions. We are seeing more flooding that occurs. Now, the flooding that occurs in London, there was a time when it, flooding was in the spring. We're now actually seeing flooding occurring in January and February because of the melting that occurs and then the weather patterns change around. We're also seeing wind storms that are extremely significant. In fact, just in the last 10 days, we've had some major issues, not only here in London, but across Ontario with wind storms and uh, I believe it's tornadoes touching down. These are all signs of severe weather and a change in climate. So it's right here in London. So we all owe it to ourselves to be paying a lot more attention, not only for Londoners' benefit, our future generations, but also to recognize around the world there is suffering that's taking place that is tied back to climate change now. Yeah. And just, I think, you know, was it in April or March, the city passed the Climate Emergency Action Plan. I'm sure you were involved in a lot of that, Jake, because climate change is the beginning of your title. But what, what went into that? Like, I, I would imagine there, there was all sorts of different dimensions that finally resulted in that approval. But what kind of work went into that? Well, it's interesting. This is where uh, working closely with the community, residents, the business community is so vitally important uh, and making sure that we're tapping into many different aspects of the community. It, it was over two years in the making hmm. and we did, did this during the pandemic. So most of the work was done online, but we managed to hear from many different 
the Londoners uh, on what their needs are towards climate change, what their aspirations are, what their concerns are. And in many ways, we heard from them speaking about others who uh, voice some voices that aren't heard. There are many people under climate change who are, well, they're disproportionately impacted because let's face it, not everyone lives the same in London. Some are living very well. Some are living in much more difficult circumstances. Yeah. There are some people who are consuming resources at a much higher level than others. This is why climate change impacts people differently. And as well, the, the impacts can be felt differently just in your own lifestyle. Yeah. So we had to include all of that in designing a plan that would make sense for London. And in fact, we came up with three key goals. And the first one was handed to, to us by a municipal council quite some time ago. They said we want to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions yeah. by the year 2050. That's 30 years away. It sounds like a long time, but it's not in the scheme of things because actions required now. They also, and the community agreed and council agreed, we've got to become more resilient. And we've got to become more resilient not only to flooding and the warmer temperatures, but also to things like poverty. Yeah. We've got to build systems to take care of our own locally. We cannot rely on food coming in from South America in the future. It's going to be too cost prohibitive and it has impacts coming in. We've got to grow more food locally, not only in London, but in Southwestern Ontario. And the third goal, a very, very important one, and, and I don't say this lightly, it's bringing everyone along. And when I say that, we've got to care about everyone. People that are in a very strong, positive place, they have financial wealth, they have strong stability. There are those on the other side and everything in between. We must care about everyone, and we do, but we've got to actually demonstrate that in a bigger and broader way, because not everyone has the same lifestyle and impact from a climate change perspective, because they're not consuming the same amount of resources. Therefore, some people are clearly going to have to do more work than others, but that's part of being a strong community. So it was passed, when was it, March or April? So just April of this year. Yeah. So uh, very big. And it was unanimous, Glenn. Yeah. How often do you see that at Municipal Council? Yeah. Not all that often on well, something that's this important. That's true. We could go into that a bit, but we won't. But you're right. So that's that's a great thing. I, I do know that uh, I'm, I'm wondering how community groups responded to it. I know that they would have had, uh, you know, uh, being able to speak to it as you were planning it. But I know as a food bank, for instance, when we suddenly decided to do the greenhouse or the green uh, green walls, and we'll hear about those again next week at the press conference, as we decided to do those, there were a lot of environmental groups and neighborhood groups and, and others that were very curious as to why would the food bank be doing that? We had suddenly kind of entered into a field that they have been working in for over two decades. They really, really believe in it. They they worked in it in a time when not too many people were very interested, including governments, perhaps even food banks. And and so all of a sudden they saw the food bank come along and, and get involved in a fairly substantial way. And, and I will say overall, uh, the response to that has been helpful. I mean, they felt that, you know, the, uh, although food banks aren't the answer to everything, they felt when it comes to urban agriculture and things like that, the food bank taking a lead with what it could there uh, w was helpful. Mm -hmm. How did those groups and others um, respond, perhaps even businesses, respond to the Climate Emergency Action Plan once it was passed? Did you get any feedback? Well, it, it, overall, very, very positive. Okay. And, 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 I, and I think because the, the concerns are legitimate, People recognize that London is, is, is in the middle of all of this, along with it, other municipalities across Canada and North America. Therefore, yeah. we've got to do our part. We've got to do what we're calling our fair share. So community groups, of course, and environmental community groups always want to do more and they want to push, push and push. And that's wonderful. And, and we need that. Businesses, some are doing exactly that. Others, they need to be nudged and sometimes nudged quite hard because it's not their main mandate. But what we've seen here in London and when we've checked with uh, our friends at the London Economic Development Corporation and they're, they're tracking the business community, yeah. it, it's well over 60% 
of the top 85 employers in London now have stated sustainability and climate change objectives on their websites. So these are signals, positive signals, that the business community is getting it, and there's many that are actually leading that. Same can be said for community groups. There are many that are, are doing their main purpose and now are adapting or adopting climate change principles into their daily work. And some are doing just a wonderful job. There's so many right now involved with the urban agricultural sector, and it, it is just wonderful. We have many involved on the mobility sector and mobility of people who want to encourage more walking, more cycling. So these groups are all doing their part, and, and, and there are all these groups that are, are going to want to support the Climate Emergency Action Plan. What we have to remember, though, Glenn, and the food bank's a perfect example, we encourage people to get involved and get out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Their comfort zone is what they might do as a community group on a day-to-day -day basis or a monthly basis. And it might be food poverty. Let's use that as an example. There is a climate change component that might not be there on the surface, but climate change is amongst, among everything that we do. Therefore, whether it's food poverty, urban agriculture, or as associations dealing with baseball and hockey, pickleball, whatever it might be, all these groups have a role to play, in part because they're getting together as an organization, they're doing their primary business, but at the same time, let's look at hockey, for example. There's no reason why there's not more carpooling occurring in hockey. You don't all need to drive individual vehicles to the hockey practice. So what do you do? Make sure that there's only a couple of vehicles going to that game or that practice. Those are the same principles that apply across yeah. many different associations. Do your primary business, but always make sure you've got sustainability and climate change built into your community agendas. That is how we're going to strengthen London when it's something that we're constantly talking about and constantly promoting and constantly taking action on. Yeah. You know, Jay, back in 2008, I was asked by Al Gore, uh, along with a hundred other Canadians, to come down to Montreal. Now, he had, not too long before that, won the Academy Award for Inconvenient Truth. And he had come to Canada yeah. because he felt Canada was such a, a good example or a potential for, for what we could do. But what ended up coming up over and over again in that weekend was, well, the problem with, though, doing all of that in a democracy is that People see that there's a need to do it, but then we end up electing governments that are sometimes at the various jurisdictions that provincial government might be for it, but a federal government might not be. Or there might be a municipal government that uh, is not for it or is trying to get something going with it and is having trouble getting funding or attention for it from the province. Um, now, last week I asked you a personal question. If you get discouraged and some of you are like, boy, you came right back at me and let me know what you thought of that, that you love your job and you think it's great but do you sense that within the three jurisdictions that we're speaking of here do you sense that there is more of a harmonization beginning to happen that that transcends a particular election where a particular party is being uh, elected and then could maybe throw it all into disarray do you sense it's getting better or is that something that still worries you Definitely still worries me. Yeah. There are some days, Glenn, where I do see the positive alignment. Yeah. And then there are days where all of a sudden you start reading policies that clearly conflict. And the challenge is, of course, that sends a mixed message, not only to residents and citizens, also to businesses. So definitely there's more work required on alignment. And in fact, a big part of our climate emergency action plan is to actually work on that alignment. We spend a lot of time making sure here at City Hall and across all the services that we do to push for that alignment in our strategic planning and also in our, our upcoming multi-year budget planning. So we had some work to do. We've also stated in our plan that we really encourage the province and the federal government. They work together hand in hand on many things and on other things they don't. And, and, and you know that from your experience. But the key part here is that it'll never be perfect, but what remains constant? People and businesses. 
we are always going to be here beyond those three and four year terms. Yeah. Therefore, we have to look at things holistically and lay out plans over a longer period of time. And what we've done in our climate emergency action plan is that we've set milestone targets. Our first big milestone is 2030. So mm, about eight to nine years from now. So that will cross over a couple terms of council. It'll cross over a couple terms of provincial and federal governments. But at the same time, if we are aligned and showing progress, I think that's going to send a very positive message. And that eventually provincial and federal governments will say there are certain things that we should just all agree on that we stay the course. Yeah. And that's what we need to strive for because that is what's going to drive that new business investment. They need to have certainty over a longer period of time. Yeah. I do remember, uh, you know, in my time as an MP in Ottawa, that certain municipalities would come up and and uh, lobby. Uh, I, de I definitely remember uh, Nahid Nanchi from Calgary coming up and they would they would lobby for climate change stuff, the help that they needed, whether it was in transportation or whatever, uh, around climate change. And they wanted the federal government's assistance. And, you know, they came up armed with the Chamber of Commerce, with the University of Calgary, as, as well as University of Alberta and Edmonton. They came with a whole bunch of different uh, citizen action groups, uh, urban leagues. So they had a vast array and they took up a, a large swath of the hotel that was near <laughs> near there that and so when they met with the federal officials i mean they came really ready and every everybody was there the federal officials realized as well hey we can't slough this one off so it wasn't right. just a mayor that came up and said i need some funding right or it wasn't just an activist group that comes up and says that you need to do more there was this gathering of forces within these communities vancouver was another one that was even bigger than the calgary one but uh that's i think to some degree what has to be done as well as we go up to queen's park or as we go up to to ottawa is that they see that all of these different sectors within our communities are doing the work they're coming together they're finding a way to harmonize their selective interests and bring them together but then we have to take that show on the road right we have to get up to Ottawa we have to get up to Queen's Park and say look we mean it as a community this covers everybody in our community I, I hope we see more of that in the future I presume municipalities are doing that correct we, we, we are and, and items like climate change affordable housing yeah. uh, poverty food insecurity these are items that we should not be debating between levels of government yeah we we need to acknowledge we need solutions and we also need to acknowledge we all have to work together on this yeah. and we see some very strong positive signs of that and and glenn with the climate emergency action plan the word i often use there is that we, we've taken some fair bit of time in the development of it to work on alignment and now it's, we've got to put that alignment to action. For a great example is that we've actually are in the process of signing a mem memorandum of understanding with Western University to work on projects together, to mm. apply for grants together, where local government, the expertise of the professors and faculty, and the expertise of the students, those future generations, can all be tied together to tackle challenges and more importantly, create opportunities. And that type of alignment is really key. We're gonna be working on that with Fantra College as well. Mm. And we've already started really good discussions with the Chamber of Commerce, the London Economic Development Corporation to get those kind of alignments yeah. to help attract new businesses to London. Because the new businesses wanna arrive in places that are already well established with respect to sustainability. So we also find that it'll be a competitive advantage that London has with all this alignment. And so challenges are out there in all municipalities, but when you've got a collection of good people working together on solutions, that then becomes basically a discriminator, a positive discriminator on why I should come to London. So yeah. we, we want to harness that kind of energy. Yeah. Jay, your green shirt suits you today. Uh, 
Thank you so much for all the leadership that you've shown. I, what I find fascinating is when, you know, you've been there at the city for 27 years, the food bank has been around for 35 years, but when we bumped to, into one another early on in the, in the food bank's history, you know, we were talking about fitting together this idea of poverty, food security, fresh food, recycling, th those kind of things, citizenship, city governance, you know, and, and we were trying to fit a lot of those things together, but it seems to me that in recent years, they've all fallen and dovetailed in together. So the idea of, for instance, food not being wasted and going towards families that are struggling in food uh, insecurity, that's just a given now, and, and people pull those things together. The idea, I think, of of uh, food security as far as providing a lot of our own food so we're not stuck with having to depend on international supplies and other things. Right. I mean, that, that's a natural thing that happens between groups like the food bank or businesses and the city. But all of those things, I think, have become, they seem to fit better than they did when it was two decades ago. We tried to mold them and put them together and it was a bit of a struggle even in messaging, right? right. Now it's not. It's much easier. And, and I really want to thank you for that. You know, you've been around for over two decades, almost three. But for <laughs> people who've been wanting to bring about this food security, fighting poverty and dealing with climate change and other things, you've always been an open person at the city towards those things. And if, if your file would have been changed all the time and then you got shoved to something else, we might not have seen the successes we've seen lately. So I just want to thank you and your staff because we know your staff really well. Thank you, all of you, for, you know, putting that kind of effort into it. And for all that you've done, it's been the consistency I have felt that's brought about the major developments here that has happened. And, and you kept in your lane. You just kept pushing it and pushing it and drawing other people in. And I really want to thank you for that, Jay, because without that consistent leadership, this stuff wouldn't be happening. Oh, thanks, Glenn. It's very kind. You know, a, a key thread through all of that, though, are volunteers. Yep. And let's face that, volunteers at the food bank, volunteers in all those community groups, um, they don't get recognized enough. But that is, I believe, one of the biggest strengths that London has to offer. We have volunteers everywhere. Yeah. And as we move forward, yep. we know we hear that term, volunteer burnout. Well, I, better days are just around the corner. This summer, they're going to start. So things are going to get better and volunteers, I, I can never say thank you enough for all that work. And for you, yourself and Jane and all the volunteers of the food bank, the relationship has been wonderful. And I look at every day as a fresh day. Mm -hmm. and it's a fresh day. And I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to next week when we get to launch the 26th annual London Cares Curb Hunger Food Drive. And our partnership continues. Thank you, Jay. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for inviting me for the conversation. Yep. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. I'm sure right now a lot of you feel like you aren't able to be who you truly are. What's most important, more important than everybody else knowing who you are is that you know who you are. As a young person, time moves slower for you. And just know that things will get better. It Gets Better Canada is a registered Canadian charity with a focus on uplifting our queer youth through the power of digital storytelling. As a two-spirit person, I use they, them pronouns, but that's not the case for every two-spirit person. There are so many voices out there that we didn't have 10 years ago, 20 years ago. No matter what your mind tells you, you really are perfect the way you are, so stop beating yourself up so much. I'm gonna be a boy in a dress, because why not? Your identity is explosive. We all have our unique journeys, but one thing that connects us all is the desire to be happy, the desire to celebrate being our authentic selves. This is Rogers TV. The law states a boater must carry up-to-date charts in the largest scale available for the body of water on which they are boating. Nautical marine charts are available for all chartered waterways across Canada. 
Mobile navigation apps can also be a good navigation aid. If you are using an app or electronic charts, it's a good idea to carry paper charts as well. They are a good backup in case of a power failure. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Tyler Fines, host of Off the Puck Hockey on Rogers Channel 20. We interview some of the biggest names in hockey and sports. Check us out, Rogers Channel 20, Off the Puck Hockey. Let's go. You're watching Rogers TV. Giovanni Petiti and you, you are the luckiest people on the planet because you're watching the RTV quiz show. This is our 102nd episode. Huh? How do we do it? We do it because we got TMT, too much trivia. That's right, folks. And we also have TMT2, which it means too much talent, too. This is the show that combines the talent of entertainment with the education of trivia in a perfect meld of what we like to call info entertainment. Now, if you've never seen the show before, sit back and relax. And if you're thinking about changing a channel, don't. Here we go. Round one. All right, round one, the category is three name town okay these are our category involves cities that have three names for example new york city that would be an example or sioux saint marie uh, oh speaking of sioux saint marie fun fact fun fact here um despite being named after a saint uh they it looks like they're not going to celebrate christmas in sioux saint marie this year Apparently, uh, city council is having a tough time finding three wise men and a virgin. That's the kind of show it is, folks. That's the kind of show. <laughs> Question number one. What major South American city's name translates to River of January? Please keep in mind, folks, that the answer is the name of a city that has three names in the city. Like, for example, New York City. Fun fact, the answer to question number one is not New York City. Question number two, in what town was William Shakespeare born? Uh, maybe we should we should uh, do it this way. Uh, in what town if was William Shakespeare born if in this? Is it? Thanks. Question number three, what is the capital city of Haiti? Capital city of Haiti. Oh, uh, fun fact. Uh, the word Haiti comes from the French word, which means I hate the fifth letter of the alphabet. See, there's no E in Haiti, and it's the fifth letter. They didn't like E, so they, they put in I's. That's... <clears throat> Question number four. What American city was founded by Brigham Young in 1847? Very famous give you a hint, uh, his father was Brigham Old. Question number five, what Canadian city got its name from the fur traders that would carry their canoes from the Assiniboine River into Lake Manitoba? Assiniboine River. Oh, uh, late breaking news, late breaking news, folks. Uh, the uh, Manitoba Daily Anyway, it says here that uh, a local man in northern Manitoba survived a bear attack using a baseball bat. Uh, apparently, he's doing fine, but his friend with the broken kneecap uh, is uh, is not doing well. You see, he used a baseball bat to break his friend's knee so he can run away, and then the bear ate his friend. That's no, it's not a true story. All right, time for round two. The category is futuristic TV, futuristic TV. All right, that's uh, TV where uh, you can see the Toronto Maple Leafs in the second round of the playoffs. It's, uh, no? 
Sorry, you can that show is on the Science Fiction Network. No. Question number six: What HBO series is about a Wild West themed amusement park populated by android hosts? So this is a show about people on, on their cell phones at a Ponderosa Steakhouse. They don't have they don't have Ponderosa Steakhouse. No, it's been a while. Outback. They're sitting at the. That's Australian. Question number seven. In Star Trek, The Next Generation, what species was Lieutenant Worf? Was he, is that a he? Was he a Romulan? B, a Kardashian? C, a Vulcan? Or D, a Klingon? I'm, I don't, I don't watch any science fiction, but I'm pretty sure it's not B, a Kardashian, because in the future, I'm pretty sure they don't work either. Question number eight. What 1960 series featured Dr. Smith, Major West, and the Robinson family aboard the Jupiter 2? It was about a family in outer space. I don't watch a lot of Star Trek, but uh, from what I can remember, uh, you don't want to be the guy who gets beamed down with... Uh, William Shatner, Dr. Spock, and uh, Jim, the doctor dude. Because if you're like the fourth guy, you're, you, ain't, you ain't coming back. Like they're like, no matter what the scenario, it's like, okay, Billy, you stand and guard the entrance. We're gonna go in the cave. You figured that'd be a safer job, but no. Especially if you're wearing a different color uh, shirt. You're not making it. You're not coming back. Question number nine. What 1950s series featured a villain called Ming the Merciless? The Merciless. The Merciless. The Merciless. Merciless. I got it. Merciless. Was it A, Flash Gordon, B, Buck Rogers, C, Battlestar Galactica, D, Captain Video. Fun fact, C, sexiest aliens ever. Question number 10. What was the name of the city that the Jetsons lived in? Meet the Jetsons. It is on Leroy. I don't know. It came on after Fat Albert. By that time, I was tapped out. All right, time for round one. Answers. The category was three name town. Question number one What major South American city's name translates into River of January? Ah, that's Rio de Janeiro. I don't know much about uh, Rio de Janeiro, but uh, I hear that Jesus is really big over there. Question number two. In what town was William Shakespeare born? Right? The answer is Stratford upon Avon. That's where Avon was also invented. With the, they, before they had doorbells, they would they were ahead of their time. Fun fact, folks: Before I got this job, uh, I was uh, actually uh, very successful selling alarm systems uh, door to door. Uh, what I would do is I'd ring a doorbell. Uh, if nobody answered, I would leave a brochure on the kitchen table. Question number three: What is the capital city of Haiti? The answer is Port au Prince. Port-au-Prince, C3. Question number four. What American city was founded by Brigham Young in 1847? That was Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City. Folks, I found this fun fact. I'm pretty sure that it's uh, that it's accurate here. Uh, but Mormons normally believe that if you marry someone down on Earth, like you're married for life, but you're also married in the afterlife. Like forever. Forever. So apparently they believe in wife after death. Long way to go. Long. 
Question number five, what Canadian city got its name from the fur traders that would carry their canoes from the Assiniboine River to Lake Manitoba? That city is called Portage La Prairie. <laughs> Question number six was what HBO series is about a Wild West themed amusement park populated by Android hosts? That of course is Westworld. Westworld. Question number seven, in Star Trek, The Next Generation, what species was Lieutenant Worf? It was D, a Klingon. You know, I've, I've dated a few Klingons in my time. I don't want to talk about it. Changed my number four times. It's not, it's not you, it's me, it's, it's me, it's me. Question number eight, what 1960s TV series featured Dr. Smith, Major West, and the Robinson family aboard Jupiter 2? That was called Lost in Space. Question number nine, what 1950s series featured a villain called Ming the Merciless? That was A, Flash Gordon. Flash. So I did a little bit of research, folks. This is way different than the Flash, okay? According to Wikipedia, this is true. This is Flash Gordon's superpowers. Agility, intellect, and leadership. Folks, that's not a superhero. That's a bad LinkedIn profile description. <laughs> huh? Question number 10. What was the name of the city that the Jetsons lived in? That was called Orbit City. Orbit City. Folks, this is really fascinating. The Jetsons came out in the 1960s, and a lot of stuff on that show that they predicted actually came true. Like the microwave, all right? Uh, the video phone, where you could see the person talking on the phone, all right? And they had a robot that does the vacuuming. And they all predicted that. Remember their maid? It was Rosie, right? She looked like a garbage can. Uh, you know you know his wife picked it out, eh? <laughs> like, I don't know, honey, maybe we should get the Wanda 2000 over there in the corner. No, no, no. We're going to get the Rosie. The one that looks like a garbage can. We're, we're going to get that one. We're going to get... Predicted that too. Okay, folks, don't go away. I have more jokes to explain. We'll be back right after this. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Tyler Fines, host of Off the Puck Hockey on Rogers Channel 20. We interview some of the biggest names in hockey and sports. Check us out, Rogers Channel 20, Off the Puck Hockey. Let's go. Okay, so we're here at the rep room looking at more fun ways to work out with your kids and introduce them to exercise. Today we're going to look at an exercise called the Farmer's Carry. Farmer's Carry is carrying weight over distance. Super important because it teaches us how to integrate the use of our legs and move while providing a lot of core stability. And the heavier you get, the more of a metabolic demand this becomes. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to bend over and pick up the weights. We're going to get our butts down. We're going to stand up nice and tall. Good. And once we get that locked out position, we're going to start to move. And you can see with this weight resistance, we're building our core strength. We're building shoulder stability. And we're learning how to integrate movement with all of this. Super important for everyday functional life. TV quiz show the hottest show on television. This is round three. The category is historic royals. Historic royals. All right. It's about royal people that are dead. Question 11. Who was the last pharaoh of Egypt? 
Her death also marked the end of the Ptolemy dynasty. It's Ptolemy, Ptolemy dynasty. The P is silent. He said, because that's how they wrote it in the original hieroglyphics. It was, uh, it was spelled uh, two eyes, uh, a cat, and an upside down triangle and fig leaf. Uh, but the cat was silent. So, meow. Question number 12, who founded the Mongol Empire? His birth name was Timajin. Timajin. I don't know why he changed his name. Maybe he owed people money. How am I supposed to know? Maybe he got teased at school. Question number 13, who was the king of England when the United States of America declared their independence? Remember that? The American Revolution with the British and... Th Folks, uh, I don't want to brag here and say I was particularly brave, but uh, back in high school, I started a revolution. Uh, I had to stop it because, uh, well, I got dizzy and uh, fell, fell down. <clears throat> Threw up a little bit in my mouth. Uh, question 14. Which Frankish king became the first Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800? He's old, man. Like, his social insurance number is probably one. That's how old he is. Question 15. Which 14-letter king ruled the Babylonian Empire from 605 BC to 562 BC? He was responsible for the construction of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. How good were the tomatoes? That's what I want to know. Big shot. Time for round four. Round four, the category is sharks. Question 16, what type of shark is this? That's Paris Hilton. <laughs> no, sorry, what type of shark is this? <sighs> Question 17, what species is the largest of all sharks? What species is the largest of all sharks? Biggest shark. Shark numero uno in size. El grande sharkone. Question 18, what are baby sharks called? A, pups. B, calves, C, hatchlings, or D, nibblers? Well, I don't know what a baby shark is called, but I'm pretty sure its first words are da da, da da, da da, da da, da da, da da, Mori Povich show, da da, 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 da da. Question 19 Which of the following is not a real type of shark? Not a type of shark. Is it A, a Pacific sleeper shark? D, an Iceland shark, C, a nurse shark, or C, a spiny dogfish, or E, a card shark. Speaking of which, folks, uh, my wife says uh, she's going to threaten to leave me because I have a poker obsession. I told her, hey, I think you're bluffing. Hold it. She's holding nothing. Holding nothing. Full house? She's holding a full house. That's a good point. Question 20. What organ helps a shark to float? Is it A, a swim bladder, B, a stomach, C, liver, D, spleen, E, water wings? That was for the kids. That was for the kids because they pictured a shark with the water wings now and they don't feel so bad that they suck at swimming. That's... Round three answers. That category was historic royals. Question 11 was, who was the last pharaoh of Egypt? Her death also marked the end of the Ptolemy dynasty. That was Cleopatra. Question number 12, who founded the Mongol Empire? His birth name was Timogen. That, of course, was Gagnus Khan. Gagnus Khan. Question 13. 
Who was the king of England when the United States of America declared their independence? That was George III. George III. I don't know about you, but I've noticed that monarchs are a lot like movies. Uh, the sequels are never as good as the original. It's like, oh, George the uh, Third. He good, George. He lost America. George the Third. That's good. That was good. Good for you. We didn't need that anyway. Question fourteen: Which Frankish king became the first Holy Roman Emperor in the year eight hundred? Ah, that was Charlemagne. Charlemagne. Question 15, which 14-letter king ruled the Babylon Empire from 605 to 562 BC? That was Nebuchadnezzar II. Question 16, what type of shark is this? That is a great white shark. Great white shark. Question number 17, what species is the largest of all sharks? They're called the whale shark. The whale shark. A fun fact here, folks. The whale shark can grow up to 18 meters long and weigh more than 19,000 kilograms. Which brings me to my next question, folks. If swimming is such good exercise, why are all the whales fat? Question 18. What are baby sharks called? Everybody knows that. The answer is... Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. We will also accept the answer A, pups. Isn't that cute? Baby sharks are called pups. Question nineteen: Which type of the following is not a real shark? An Iceland shark. Iceland shark. Fun fact: There is a Greenland shark. Fun fact: That's a, another reason not to visit Greenland. That's. Question 20, what organ helps a shark to float? The answer is C, liver. C, liver. A fun fact here, fun fact here is uh, the liver is the only organ in the body that if damaged can regenerate itself. So, well, 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 I'll drink to that. <laughs> we'll be back right after this, don't go away. <laughs> Monday night's a winner with Optimus TV Bingo on Rogers TV. With a weekly prize board of $3,000, the money raised funds projects to help the youth in our community. You can pick up your cards at over 90 locations across London, and for only $2, you get six chances to win. Watch, play, and win every Monday night at 8 p.m. with Optimus TV Bingo on Rogers TV or streamed live at rogerstv.com. Hi, I'm Dan Mailer. I'm the host of London Lights, the show where we talk about notable Londoners who have made a big mark, a big impact on the world of music, entertainment, sports, politics. Today, our guest is Jonathan Hollow, Yuri Poole of the McCartney years, the one and only Jim Chapman, Peter Brennan of Jeans and Classics fame. London Lights, Thursday at 8.30. Rogers TV has given me a ton of opportunities, including meeting new people, getting involved in my local community, and trying a ton of variety of different production roles, such as graphics, camera, and audio. Hi everyone, my name's Ranger M. I love to knowledge share, and that's just what I'm gonna do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. All right, welcome back to our TV quiz show. This is round five. We have double, double, double point answers. Why? Because I like to ring the bell. The category is one of a kind. So all of these are very unique, one of the kind in its own category. Here we go. Question number 21. 
What is the only country that starts with the letter Y? Letter Y. That was easy. Yo, Canada. Only one country in the world starts with the letter Y. Question 22. What is the only marsupial found in North America? Marsupial. Now, a marsupial is an animal that carries its live young in a pouch like a, or like a purse. Speaking of purses, folks, uh, my wife uh, has been hinting that for our anniversary, she wants a coach purse. I did a little research and found out how much they cost. So I'm going to surprise her with a assistant coach purse. <laughs> Question 23. What is the only element on the periodic table that starts with the letter U? You no know, different elements start with different letters like oxygen starts with O, potassium starts with K. So if they went out at I guess it would be okay. Hey, hey, they laughed at that joke when I was a uh, high school science club president. Uh, okay, vice president, uh, secretary, assistants. Okay, I washed the test tubes. Question 24. What is the only NFL team with a logo based on a plant? Based on a plant. See, you're going through all the teams right now. Based on a plant. <laughs> You don't get very many teams named after plants uh, that don't suck. Question 25, what is the only even prime number? There's only one even prime number? Well, that's odd. Time for round five answers. Here we go. What's the only country in the world that starts with the letter Y? That's Yemen. Yemen. Question 22. What is the only marsupial found in North America? That's a opossum. Opossum. Well, sometimes we refer to in North America as possums, uh, but if they're from Ireland, they're opossums. Question 23. What is the only element on the periodic table that starts with the letter U? The answer is uranium. One of the most toxic uh, elements on the periodic table. A uh, fun fact, uh, the group of scientists who discovered uranium uh, six months later uh, discovered uh, barium. Question 24, what is the only NFL team's logo that's based on a plant? That's the New Orleans Saints. New Orleans Saints. It's a fleur de lis, which is French for a lily. Well, they just call the team the New Orleans Lilies. <laughs> Question 25, what is the only even prime number? It's the number two. Number two, a fun fact, folks. Uh, mathematicians have discovered that prime numbers are a lot like marijuana users. Uh, the higher they get, uh, the more spaced out they are. you and nobody else people till next time stay safe stay calm and stay nice call the rogers tv viewer response line email us or connect with us on social media Hi, my name is Gerald. I'm a volunteer at Rock here at Rogers TV. I'm really happy with all the great things I've learned from video productions for Rogers, all the great people I've met, and being part of a great community. I'm Jennifer Slay, the host of What's Up London. Join me each week as I meet Londoners who are doing extraordinary things and helping to make the city a better place to live. Watch What's Up London Mondays only on Rogers TV. Sometimes, for a wish to come true, it takes a kingdom, because together is stronger. Tied tight, united we stand, in honor of one child's wish, to fuel the fire that will grant many more.
join the kingdom. Looking for the best way to get the Major League Baseball games you want to watch? Rogers Super Sports Pack has you covered. With MLB Extra Innings, you'll have a premium...